the O'Reilly factor, the good, the bad, and the completely ridiculous in American life. And in the Fox Studios in New York, Bill O'Reilly is there. And I want to ask him right off the bat, why do you think your book is number one again? I have no idea, Mr. Lamb. Do, do you know how, <laughs> I just, I'm as surprised as everybody else. I thought we'd do okay with it. But uh, to be uh, on the New York Times list, it'll be eight weeks at number one, a week from Sunday. Uh, it's just staggering to me. Um, I believe that the book is very informative to working Americans. I think a lot of them are buying it for their children, which I encourage. I wish I had a book like this when I graduated from high school and college. I think it lays out what the American system is and how the working man has very little power these days. And all of these things are useful to people's lives. This isn't kind of an ideological uh, tome where I'm venting about uh, politicians and, and what you should think. This is a, an odyssey that I've lived, and I think that all people should, have the, should know the lessons that I've learned the hard way. You lead off with your first chapter, The Class Factor, and you say right up top, note to Reverend Jesse Jackson, sorry, Jesse, you're wrong. Racism gets all the ink, but the heart of America's somewhat unfair social setup is class, not race. This fact might cut into your power base, but it's true. Absolutely. African Americans are probably the biggest victims of the class situation we have in America today, and it's not because of the color of their skin anymore. Yes, there are bigots. Yes, uh, there are narrow-minded people, but they're very, very few in my opinion. But all of us in the working class are subjected to punitive taxes, uh, being ignored by the elite media, uh, not getting any kind of special interest help in Washington like the fat cats get. We're all in that same boat, no matter what color we are. And that's the real problem right now, I believe, not race. I, not, I'm not diminishing the race problem, but I don't think it's as uh, intense as the class problem. I'll bring it up again because I see the name Jesse Jackson often here, and a couple pages later you say, ridiculous note. Jesse Jackson, who likes to call himself a creative capitalist, has, not, has four not-for-profit organizations, yet he does uh, not itemize on any of his tax returns. We do get some very interesting hints, however. His Rainbow Push organization reported 1.5 million in travel and convention expenses in one year alone. Who got that money? Which averages an astronomical $3,500 a day, and you go on to question the money. Why do you pinpoint Jesse Jackson so much? Well, because I think this is a great example of somebody who has used the system to um, his own benefit. Now, Reverend Jackson, by his own admission, is a millionaire. He has no job. Uh, he works at CNN, I guess, once a week, but that doesn't pay him very much. And I think Americans have an obligation to demand that people getting money from the government, and I um, don't know whether you remember this, Mr. Lamb, but Alexis Herman in the Carter administration funneled over millions of dollars to Jackson's uh, um, entities. Also, he gets tax-free status. And we don't know where his money is. He has not been audited since 1982. And at that time, the IRS found him to be a million light, and he was penalized about $750,000, which he paid back in eight years with no interest. You try to get a deal like that. So I don't want any special treatment for anybody. And I think that Reverend Jackson owes his constituents and the rest of us an explanation. He files his tax returns. He does not itemize. You try that. Let's go to Delray Beach, Florida, for our first call for Bill O'Reilly, originally from Levittown, New York. Good morning. Hello, Delray Beach. Hi, hi. I just walked out of the room for a minute. I didn't think I'd be on so quickly. Please go ahead. I, I have a question uh, regarding. Um, oh God, I'm. I'm um, the so-called liberal media. Um, you hear, you keep hearing so much about the liberal media. I don't think it exists. For instance, I would like him to tell me what nationally, um, uh, what, what national figure is on the air who is a liberal I'm, I'm talking about I'm talking about um, conservatives who are all over the air like Oliver North and Rush Limbaugh and Michael Reagan etc caller do you watch Bill O'Reilly well look I mean there are liberal commentators on the air as Alan Combs there's you just had one uh, uh, Ellen Ratner I mean it's it's a balance but when I don't buy into the liberal media traditionally the way right-wingers do either. I work for CBS News and ABC News, and nobody ever told me, hey, slant your story a certain way. But I will say this, that there is 
in the elite media of the United States. Now we're talking New York Times, Washington Post, and the networks. There is a bias toward the power elite. That is, they exclude stories based on working people. They don't find those stories interesting. Now, I'm talking generally now, okay? I mean, I have to make my points in a broad brush here. But I'll give you an example. And, and they also succumb to power um, uh, organizations who put pressure on people. I did a story for CBS News in the 80s on the gay um, infestation of Provincetown, Massachusetts, um, where this little fishing village populated by Portuguese all of a sudden found itself as a gay mecca. I did a story that was kind of troubling because the people there said that we don't want 3,000 gays coming over on the ferry every weekend because our kids don't know what the heck's going on. CBS would not run that story. Even though it was accurate, even though it was right down the line what was happening in America, they wouldn't run it because they were afraid to alienate the gay lobby. Now that's what I mean when I say there is bias in the media. But I'm not talking an ideology here. Let's go to Fort Wayne, Indiana on the Republican line for Bill O'Reilly. Hello. Uh, yes. Uh, <clears throat> I wanted to ask, uh, uh, really refer to uh, some things that Hel Eleanor Ratner stated. Uh, she, <clears throat> and I'd just like to make three statements. <clears throat> uh, one was she said she didn't think that Colin Powell should be <clears throat> uh, 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 appointed to the position to which uh, Bush has appointed him because he's a military person, and yet Eisenhower <clears throat> was our president for two, two terms. Uh, the second thing she said was that Ashcroft should have to take an oath before the Senate uh, and express his opinions, <clears throat> and, um, and that the oath is what that they would hold him to. Now, Clinton took an oath, and they didn't hold him to a doggone thing, if you remember correctly. <clears throat> and the last thing that I'd like you to explain, uh, uh, Bill, is that... Um, the Beck Law, which is supposed to control uh, union contributions uh, to political parties, uh, was actually rescinded by Clinton, was one of the first things he rescinded when he went into office. Now, can you explain or tell the public a little bit about the Beck Law? Thank you, and I'll listen. I can. Uh, I'm not an expert on that law, but I will say this. If any campaign finance legislation is passed, it has to include... Um, some kind of a watchdog um, apparatus on the unions because you can't be taking away fat cat money on the right and letting fat cat money on the left still uh, exist. So, look, we all know that the government is now under the influence of very wealthy forces in this country, where it's the, where is it the unions or it's the big corporations. We've got we've to get away from that, and I'm with John McCain and Senator Feingold on that, and I think we've got to pass that legislation. In your book, you have an aside that, that uh, you went to school at, at Boston with uh, Howard Stern. Is that right? Yeah, we were in the same class at Boston University at the School of uh, Public Communication there. I didn't really know him, but he was the only guy who was taller than I was in the school, so I noticed him, <laughs> but I mean, wasn't pals with him. Are people surprised when they meet you that you're 6'4"? Yeah, because, you know, you're always on your knees on television begging for viewers. <laughs> so, I mean, I come across in most, a lot of TV guys are really little. So when I come in, I'm this towering guy, and everybody goes, whoa. But it's good because a lot of people, you know, don't know me when I'm out in public and all of that. So I, although I don't mind people coming over and saying hello, it, it makes my life a little bit easier. Trumbull, Connecticut, Democratic line for Bill O'Reilly. Yes, I'm so glad to get on because I cannot stand... Bill O'Reilly. I hope I get this chance to say this. I like you very much, Brian. I'm so glad he's on this morning. I am African American. I am so doggone sick and tired of you putting down our leader, Jesse Jackson, Al Sharpton, and whoever else. You do not speak for us. Speak for your own self. Talk about some of those conservative people and yourself. You are most definitely conservative. How stupid do you think we are when you constantly get on the air every night and swear and say, oh, I'm not conservative. I'm just a leave Bill Clinton alone. The man is out of office now, or just about to be. You've got all your white brothers in there now. So why don't you shut the hell up and that stupid RNL? I can't believe she's so stupid pandering to you every night. I wouldn't buy your book if you gave it to me. Get a life, Bill O'Reilly. All right, well, look, madam, I mean, you're entitled to your opinion. You're reacting emotionally, and you're looking at things in a black and white situation. Um, now, if you want to live your life that way, you go right ahead. But my job is to keep an eye on everybody. That's what I do. I put everybody under the microscope. I don't care what color they are. We have a lot of African-American viewers here at the O'Reilly Factor. 
Uh, we get a lot of mail from people who want honesty on all levels, and I don't report on racial politics. I report on everybody the same way. Here on Ohio Republican Line, you're on with Bill O'Reilly. Hello, my name is Tina, and I just wanted to thank you, actually, because I'm a history major, and um, you talked about the classes and separation, and the first thing that I thought of was the French Revolution and the noble and the bourgeoisie and the peasants and how they started out and then they all separated and it created major problems, as we all know. And, you know, I feel that in our country, as a young person in our country, I kind of, it scares me a little bit when I, like what just went down with the presidential election and how the classes are very separated. And I mean, I have, get this, I have a lady that was running for a representative that lives across the street from me, but maybe because I don't drive a nice car or whatever, or I'm just a college student, she didn't even take the time to come over and knock on my door and say I'm running for the state representative. And I wrote her this letter in email, and I believe that people in the United States need to really, really make our representatives and our senators work for what they have. And I'm all like, there's no way you're getting my vote. You live across the street from me. I know your name by commercials, not by you coming over here and telling me who you are. I mean, Thanks, caller. i got to go on. Mr. O'Reilly. All right, well, look, there's good news here in the sense that uh, I don't like snobbiness and I don't like exclusionary tactics on the part of the government or the media toward working Americans. I think it's very, very wrong. But just keep in mind one thing, and I'm, I'm glad you're a college student. If Bill O'Reilly, me, from Levittown, with no advantages, no money, okay, and kind of a questionable personality, if I can get to the top of the New York Times bestseller list and have the number one rated cable news program in America, if I can do that, you can do that. Or you can do whatever you want. In the sense that the United States has a framework that everybody can succeed if they work hard and if they're smart and if they're honest. You can succeed that way. Now, maybe you're not going to get to the top of the New York Times list, but you will have a satisfying life. That's the good news. The bad news is that still, after 200 years in our republic, the working class, and I'm including every color in this, do not have enough voice here, and that the moneyed people have the power and control. Bill O'Reilly, uh, have you gotten any reaction from conservatives about the following paragraph? And you talk about people in your book, and here's Jesse Helms. Not Jesse Jackson, Jesse Helms. This guy is old, and he hates Wayne Newton. But that doesn't count for much since he hates just about everything and everybody and is still holding a grudge over the Civil War. Sorry, Jesse, the war of northern aggression. He symbolizes the worst in American politics, aside from being Big Tobacco's fiercest champion, the good voters of North Carolina deserve better, but Jesse's divisive. Take no prisoners campaigns. Bring out the crazies and scare off potential opponents. He's a bad thinker, legislator, and storyteller. When people call him a staunch conservative, they mean, quote, unable to hear anything anyone else is saying. Bad, bad, bad. You bet. You see, I mean, this, uh, I, once again, I'm an independent. And I look at people and judge them on what they do. And Jesse Helms... I'm sorry, I'm not uh, overlooking um, the opportunities that he denied working Americans, primarily blacks, in his state. I'm not overlooking the tobacco legislation that he rammed through. They knew that tobacco was bad, but he was doing this for his own power base, and I don't respect that. And I'm going to call him the way I see him. I don't care where these people are, conservative, liberal, in the middle. Have you gotten any... Uh, sure, I get... Look, I get heat from every side. This is what is such a joke about people calling up, calling me a conservative or a liberal or whatever. Hey, I'm just the news guy who analyzes the news and calls them the way I see them. That should be happening all over the place. The fact that it just happens occasionally is stunning to me. And I think that's... If you wanted to put it in a nutshell, that's the success of the O'Reilly Factor television program and book. Can be seen on the Fox News channel at what time every uh, week? 8 o'clock Eastern Time. Um, Is it repeated? And, and repeated at 11 Eastern Time, so the West Coast gets us at 8 o'clock as well. San Antonio, Texas, a Democrat. You're on with Bill O'Reilly. Mr. O'Reilly, I'm calling from San Antonio, and I, too, am a black person. Are you aware of a book entitled The Slaughter by... Carol Chase about the U.S. Army 
killing over a thousand black soldiers in a Mississippi town. I am not aware of that book, sir. 